which was once delivered unto the saints. Yes. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you tonight. Yes. We thank you for your word, Father. We ask, Lord God, that you would just have your way tonight in this Bible study, Father. Open up our ears and that we may hear open up our minds of understanding, that we would understand the revelation that has been brought to us on tonight, Father. We ask that your spirit will go forth and do what, Lord God, it is set out to do to help people change in their hearts, in their minds, Father that their minds will be renewed, that their minds will be transformed. Father, that they will be saved in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you right now for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're going to do and for the deliverance that you're bringing to your people and bringing in the house of the Lord. Father, we thank you for we know that we are a remnant, Lord God, in this last day, Father, that will go out into the world, God, that will preach and teach the truth of your word. Father, we thank you right now. And we forever give your name the glory. Lord, use these lips of clay. Lord God, use them as you see fit. Let it be as a pen of a ready writer, Father. I thank you, Lord. Let my mind be your mind, my eyes, your eyes, Father. Let my ears be your ears. Father, use this vessel of clay in any way you see fit tonight, Lord. And we thank you. And we forever give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen. Amen. And praise God. And we are talking we're going to be talking and teaching tonight on contending for the faith contending for the faith amen this for some reason the lord uh last wednesday with, with, with my the apostle eugene taught on discern, discernment discerning of spirits uh the sunday prior to that uh, two sundays ago uh, the Lord had me teach on what people do not want to hear, dealing with people in church and them closing their ears to the truth. And now tonight the Lord has brought me once again, and we for some reason cannot get away from this. And, and whenever we see the Lord moving in this type of way, it's because he is trying to seriously relay a message to the people. He's trying to give a warning. And I was talking with my husband, we were talking, I said, it's, it's, it's just, I feel an urgency. It's like the Lord, when I was in the call, my closet of prayer, he spoke to me, he said, contending for the faith. So I immediately turned to the book of Jude and began to read, he began to deal with me. And I said, Lord, he said, there are people that are in the body of Christ that are going to either start contending for the faith or they're going to be lost. Um, and so we see that Jude was given, Jude, which is the half-brother of Jesus Christ, which was the brother of James, amen, was writing this letter to the church, amen. And what we have to understand is that um, are we in this last day going to have courage to stand for the truth of God's word when everybody around you is laughing or criticizing talking against the word. How do you know that in the, this, the world we're living in today, many people do know, they no longer believe in the true, perfect word of God? How many of you really know that? People, how many of you really believe that? We are living in a society where the Bible in the big beginning, in the book of Genesis, says there's going to be a generation that does not know the Lord. We are living in that generation. We have young people, we have children, we have adults alike that do not know anything about the house of God, that do not know anything about the Lord, that do not even know a scripture from the word of God. They cannot recognize it or, or discern spiritually anything in this life. We are living in a generation that does not know God, and we are living in a time where we're going to have to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints. He said it was delivered to us. We cannot place a value on, the, on any of the books in the Bible according to the size that they are. Jude is a small book with only one chapter in it. But it is still relevant. 
it is still as important to, and it still pertains to us today. The book of Jude contains only 25 verses. It's very a very simple style, a very simple writing, and yet it conveys a message of authority and love and is as important today and it was written thousands of years ago, but it's still prevalent for us right now. And when you read in the book of Jude, the same thing that Jude was warning and, and telling the church, the believers to contend for, is the same thing God is warning and telling us even today to contend for. It seems Jude's original intent um, was to write about a common salvation. That was his goal at first was to write about a common salvation of the believers. That is, that it was a letter that was going to celebrate the grace and the goodness of God. But it took a different turn. It went another direction because an issue arose in the body of believers, and Jude felt impressed to address this situation. Jude saw that false teachers had crept into the early church, Seeking to rob and pervert God's people. How do you know that there are false teachers in the world? That there are false teachers not only in the world, but right in the church, right in the pulpits. There were false teachers, and so Jude saw this. Uh, and he began, instead of writing about the goodness of the Lord and addressing uh, uh, the common salvation, he said, I'm going to write about the false teachers, and I'm going to give you a warning. They were seeking to rob them of their understanding and to keep them from enjoying the blessings of the Lord. How do you know that whenever you are somewhere and you, you get wrong direction, you end up going in the wrong, wrong, wrong way? Amen. Nobody wants to get told the wrong direction. Nobody wants to be instructed the wrong way. We all, because we, we're trying to get, get somewhere. We're trying to get there on a, in a, in, in, at a good time. And if we in, end up having to go around about or go a long way around it, we may not never get there because we were given the what? Wrong directions or the wrong instruction. And, and, and it robs us of our time. It robs us of our energy. It robs us of everything. Why? Because sometimes you can get confused. You know how you get your navigation system? Sometimes that navigation system has you going all over the place. And then before long, you're confused about where you at. Okay? And that's just how it is. Praise God. That's just how it is when we have false teachers giving out wrong instructions and watering down the word of God. Jude urged his readers to contend earnestly for the faith. In verse 3, what exactly did Jude mean by contending for the faith? The Greek root word for uh, 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 contend is epagamos, and it means to fight or to stand for. It speaks of battling, warring, struggling, difficulties, laboring fervently, and dangers. So when you're contending for the faith, you are going to be confronted with difficulty. You are going to be confronted with struggles. You are going to be confronted with a battle. You, you're going to be in war. How do you know that you are in a spiritual warfare? Right. That you are warring against things that you cannot see. Right. You are warring against spirits that you cannot fight. And, and the enemy knows this. And so if he gives you wrong instructions, if he sends people your way that will lead you down the wrong path, you will never obtain victory. You will never seize the moment to be the head and instead of being the tail. You will always be at the bottom because your instructions that you are following are taking you in the wrong direction. Somebody say amen. And so we see that, that Jude uh, chose the present form, the present verb, which means that it was a continuous action. It was not just you contend one, one time and then that's it. Contending, he meant you contend. You continuously contend until the day Jesus comes or until the day you part this life. A continuous action to earnestly fight for, to labor for, to fervently uh, endure difficulties. This is not something that you're going to sit back and be laid back and, and have inactivity. You have to be active when you're contending. You have to be engaged in something when you are contending. Right, right. First Timothy 6 and 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. The same faith here in book, the book of Timothy is the 
same faith that Jude is speaking of when he says contend for the faith. It comes from a Greek word pistis, meaning uh, your belief system, your faith, something that you are fighting for. The faith to which Jude and Timothy is referring is not a personal faith, but rather what we believe about salvation. What we believe about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism in the name of Jesus. The doctrine of Christ. The one true God manifest in the flesh. Do you understand? Do you really know? Have you really been instructed and been delivered the word of God as Jesus delivered to his saints? He delivered this message to the disciples. He sat with them for three years. He taught them. He, he, he ate with them. He broke bread and he showed them the revelation of who he was. He gave them. He told them, just wait for you to be endued from power on high because I'm getting ready to send back a comforter for you and you're going to receive power. Power to do what? Being overcome. Power to do what? Power to war. Power to do what? Power to labor. Power to fight. Power to endure difficulties. Some of us are not because we don't know how to endure our difficult times. And then how do you endure difficult times by contending in your prayer closet? Some of us say we pray, but, but, but our actions and our behaviors don't show that we really believe what we pray. Because if you believe what you pray, you're going to be contending wholeheartedly for, for the faith. What do you really believe in? Do you really believe the word of God? We have people that say, I believe God's word. I believe what he says. But, but then our action shows differently. Timothy said, fight the good fight. Are we really fighting the good fight of faith? Are we really enduring it? Are we really enduring the harsh times that we're getting ready to face in this life? Because when you say, I stand for the Lord, you're getting ready to face hard times. So we have to understand that the faith that Timothy and Jude were writing about to contend for and to fight for was not our personal faith, our own personal beliefs, but it's the faith and the, and the doctrine of God's word, the teaching of God's word. Suppose I were to ask you a question. What do you believe in? How many of you, how many of you would honestly be able to answer that? If I was to put that to you, what do you really believe in? Are you, are your beliefs settled enough in your own mind that you can articulate them clearly to someone else? Do you believe in God's word enough and have it founded in your spirit enough and in your mind that if someone was to ask you how to be saved, that you could truly articulate that to them or, or explain the salvation message that Jesus preached or on the that uh, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost uh, and have them with an understanding. Right. Are you able, do you really believe it? Could you explain God's salvation plan? Could you explain the full immersion of baptism in Jesus' name? Could you really explain the one God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, received back up into glory? Could you really articulate that to someone because you believe it so heartily that you're contending for the faith that they would have an understanding of God's salvation plan? Because if you can't, then what do you really believe in? It is important to be able to communicate these truths because that is how the true gospel has been preserved. You know how the gospel was preserved? Through men and women of God that preached the truth, that was able to articulate and teach other people. And then it went on and it was like a ripple effect. And that one taught another one. And Peter taught and all 3,000 got saved on the day of Pentecost. And, and then they went out and they began to teach. And the 12 disciples went out and they spread the gospel. And they all taught the same thing. Because they all had the same belief system. They all believed the truth of God's word. They were able to articulate it, to teach it, to preserve the truths of God's word, the right. truths of his faith, faith, faith. Amen. They were clearly able to preserve the gospel of Jesus Christ because their belief system, they contended for 
faith. So it's important that we understand we have to be able to explain it. As Paul explains in Colossians 1 and 6, this faith was delivered to us not simply to be believed and to be kept, but to be shared. When God saved me, he did not save me to just believe what I had been taught, but never to share with anyone else. Because had, he, had I done that, half the people in this room right now would not be saved. So we understand that it's not for us just to get it and believe in it, but it's for us to share it and not be afraid. We have to contend for the faith. I've been faced with hardships. I've been faced with difficulties. I've been faced with, with, with harsh labors and, and things that could have really brought me down. But I refuse to give in. I want to be like Timothy. I want to fight the good fight. Because I say, God, why would you save me? Bring me out of sin. Put my feet on a firm foundation for me to go right back into the same quicksand that you brought me out of. I said, Lord, I have enough faith in your word to know that if you saved me, you delivered me, you set me free, that you can keep me through anything that I go through. You would have not, you would not have brought me this far to leave me. God did not bring us this far to leave us. He did not save you for you to get in, for you to throw in the towel, for you to quit, for you to go back. He said, just like a dog returning back to his vomit. You know how gross that is uh, when you see a dog throw up and then he turns around and eats it. That is so disgusting. That's how it is when we come into God. But then we return back to our own. Oh, we are not contending for the faith that was delivered unto us. It was shared by the apostles. It was shared by someone in your life to you. And that's why you're here today. Amen. We must look at the letter that was written, that Jude wrote. In verse 4 we read, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly people who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. People had crept in, false prophets, false believers, and then they began to pervert. You know how people do when you get saved, you get in church, you're ready to get your life right. People want to come to you and then they want to start trying to tell you, you believe that, that ain't right, that ain't real. That ain't you. That ain't what the Bible says. Right, right, right. Who said that? Jesus said it. It's right there, black and white. But then they creep in. They try to get in your ear. They try to talk to you and try to persuade you to go a different way. Right. But Jews said you have to contend against these type of false believers and these type of false teachers. Do you know how many times people try to persuade me that what I what I read in the Word of God was not so? But I contended for the faith. I warred for the faith. I had to confront some people. I had to get in a debate with some people. Not in an argument, in a debate to let them know, look, you can't change my view on the word of God. You've come too many years too late to change the outlook of the belief system that God has instilled in me. I read it in his word. I know that it works. I know where he brought me from. I know the Holy Ghost is real. I know that when I went down in the name, I'm no longer covered in sin. Right, right, right. I know that when he gave me the spirit, he gave me power. You came to me too many years too late to try to dissuade me from the truth. I'm going to contend for the faith. I, I got to fight on in spite of the difficulties that I might face, in spite of the hardships that I might endure. I have to contend earnestly for the faith. Right. Right. Believers, we have to contend for the faith. We can't just give up at the slightest whim of difficulties in our life. Don't you know, I've been saved going on, but I've been married 26 years this, this Sunday. And I've been saved half of them. Don't you know we face difficulties? Don't you know we face hardships? Don't you know it was times I wanted to quit? Uh, but something down on the inside of me, Sister Tamika, said you can't give up now. You've got to keep pressing in spite of what you're going through. It's going to get better when you get down the road a little bit of the way. Uh, but don't give up now because you're right, you're right there. You're just a couple of miles from your victory. You 
if I can keep contending, Sister Elaine. It doesn't matter. Contend for the faith that was delivered. God did not bring any of us in here today uh, just to occupy a space. Uh, he brought us here because he created us. Uh, he ordained you. Don't you know he knew you before you were ever formed in the womb of your mother? He called you. He ordained. I said, Lord, I, when I think about that, I, I said, God, you knew what I would be. You knew what I would be doing. You knew the path my life would take before I ever was formed in the womb of my mother. You called me by name. We have all been called by name. And what the enemy wants to do is cause you not to believe in your own destiny. Cause you not to believe in the, your creator. The one that created the heavens and the earth. The one that caused the breath to come into your body. How do you think when you came out of the womb, breath entered into your spirit, into, your, into this mortal flesh? It was the breath of God that breathed life into you. That gave you the very existence for you to live. And we have to contend for the word of God. We have to. Don't you know the devil? He's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And if he sends people that just like angels of light and they come and they teach the word, but then they take it and they do it teaching half truth, part truth, or no truth. To cause you to be perverted. To be led astray. Jude saw the false teachers were infiltrating the church. These apostates crept in. Apostates mean rebellious. Yes. Traitors. They were traitors of the gospel. They traded God out for the world. How silly. They traded the creator that created the world out for his creation. Right. They stop contending. They crept in, sneaking a little bit at a time. Don't you know that's how the devil does? He sneaks in a little bit at a time. We give a toehold. We get a foothold. And next thing you know, he got a stronghold. He does it little bit by little bit. He does it real subtle. Real subtle. He's sneaking in on you. Then he start talking to you. Then he start lying to you. Once he sees you give ear to it, he said, oh, I got, I got the attention now. Then he starts giving you a little bit at a time and telling one little lie. Then he starts telling you another little lie. Then he starts telling you a bunch of lies. And before long, you, don't, you believe it. You've been carried away with it. Why? Because, because you gave ear to a false teaching, to a lie. So they snuck in, snuck in and they did it little bit by little bit under the guise of being a true believer, faithful believer. But in reality, they were counterfeits. Right. We have counterfeits have in the way, church. Lord. Have your way, Lord. Perpetrating. They're really not contending. That's why God said He's going to separate the sheep from the goat. Right. He said, let the wheat and the tear grow together. Yes, Lord. That's why, as, a, as an apostle, Pat, I can't run around trying to clean up everybody's life because God said He's going to do that. Right. He's going to separate. The wheat from the tears. Right. They all look alike. They all gonna grow the same. But when it comes down to it, the wheat gonna be taken and the tear gonna be bundled up to be burned. He gonna separate them in the end. Don't you know we all have an end date to leave this life? And if we're not where we need to be, if we have not been contending, like Paul said, I fought a good fight. How many of us can say we really been fighting the good fight of faith, as Timothy said? But they come in and they begin to teach all these uh, 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 false doctrines. These liberal teachers under the pretense of being correct and wanting to grow the church and build up the saints. That's what they say. They want to grow the church. They want to build up the saints. But they're teaching lies. And they're teaching falsehood. They won't announce, I'm a, I, I, I'm a false prophet. I'm a false teacher. They don't believe in half the books in the Bible. Wow. Or even think, they, they, they'll even think the book of Revelation is only a myth. Mm. Sure. But they're not going to tell you that. No, they sleep in, they camouflage. Move mixing truth with error. And once inside the church, they can do significant damage yeah. with their flawed, counterfeit 
apostate doctrine. Right. You know how they can do damage? Because it will cause people to believe that they are right in the condition that they're in. Yes. People will go to church and they'll feel they're all right and they're still living in sin. But when you're contending for the faith and you're a true believer and you preach the truth, just like I preached two seconds ago, things that people don't want to hear anymore, you got to tell people. You have to let them know you are not all right where you're at. You are camouflaged. You are being deceived. And anybody, and any pastor, and any teacher, and any apostle, anybody that tells you anything contrary to the word of God, God said, let them be accursed. If they told you you were all right in your sinful state, if they didn't correct you, if they didn't chastise you, if they didn't let you know the truth, you cannot be contending for the faith and be holding on in the world. You can't fight the good fight. you got to lose one or the other. The Bible has much to say about false teachers coming into the church, upsetting and dividing it uh, under false pretenses. Liberal teachers, those who deny the infallibility of scripture, infiltrate the body, bringing with them their false counterfeit doctrines. The fact is our theology should govern our morality. Right. Mm. Your belief system should govern how you live. If you say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in his word, how are you living? Because if you really believe in them, if you really believe the truth of the word, then your belief system should govern your morality. Yes, right. Come yes, on. Yes. Thank you, Lord. But yes. what false prophets and false teachers and yes. false apostles and false bishops and all these false people say, instead, they adjust their theology to fit their sinful behavior. All right, yes. All right now. Liberal. Apostate theology allows for all kinds of humanistic thinking and behavior. They allow it. They won't contend for the faith. They won't cause people to really want to change their lives and be transformed and be right. What would it look like? God transformed me. He brought me out. I know how I used to be. I used to party. I used to drink. I used to club. it. I used to get down with it, baby. I know about it. I wasn't always saved. I came out of the world and don't ever want to go back to it. Yes. Don't want no part of it. Because when you think you're having fun, it really ain't fun. You're blind. And don't want no part of it. I love the peace. I love the joy. I love being clean. I love being holy. I love being right before God. I love to go to prayer. I love to walk up right. I love to treat people right. I love to talk right. I want to live right. Because that's what I was created for. So, gradually these erroneous ideas weaken the entire fellowship by first undermining individuals who in turn destabilize their families. So you know what the plot is? Say it. Mm. You know what the plot is? They come into the church to tear the church up. Right. That's right. And weaken the entire body. Mm -hmm. Then if they weaken the body, they can start undermining and lead the straight individuals in the body. Then after they get the individuals, they go into the homes and they start tearing up and destroying the home life. That's the plot. Get people to teach false doctrine. People think they are right where they at. And we fall on the home, the family, the church, and everything tore up and destroyed. Eventually, the firm biblical foundation of that fellowship, my God, before you know it, it is destroyed. Mm. Lord, I lost my space. Thank you, Jesus. Eventually, the firm biblical foundation of that fellowship is cut out from beneath it. Another factor in the propagation of a false teaching is popularity. Right. Charismatic celebrity preachers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, we, we 
we all in charge. I don't even look at TBN, Word Network, all this stuff on television. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all celebrity. It's all half of them trying to be like Hollywood. They, they're not preaching the truth. They're not preaching against sin. They're not preaching holiness. It, it's all about being popular, being a celebrity, being glamorous, being glamorized. Let me tell you something, baby. The gospel is not glamorous. That's right. Mm, Jesus. Jesus on the cross was not glamorous. Peter being crucified upside down was not glamorous. Paul being beheaded was not glamorous. So, so all these charismatic celebrity preachers in our culture tend to attract a lot of people. Be careful. Don't ever be taken in by the charismatic media personality, no matter who it is. I don't care who it is. Oh, they're on TV. Uh, come on. They coming to our church. Really? Are they living right? Are they preaching right? How do you know? Are they preaching against sin? Or are they preaching something just for people to hear? Just to cause them to get up and run and do. But are they really preaching holiness? Are they really preaching, come out from among them and be ye shepherds, saith the Lord? Because that's what the Lord said. Okay, too many people believe whatever they hear from a prominent, charismatic preacher. Oh, he said it, T.D. Jake said it, I believe it. Juanita Biden said it, I believe it. Joyce Myers said it, I believe it. And then you see them on TV getting beat up by their husband, they fighting all out the street. But we believe it. But they not even contending for the faith. You see them on television in, in drama and all kind of things going on in their lives. Why? Because they're really not contending for the faith. Anybody can get on TV and perpetrate, right. but do you really know how they're living? Do you really know what they're doing? That was just like the, the, the preacher died of the drug overdose in the hotel with prostitutes. Charismatic preacher, big and popular, everybody believed, but when he was found out, they were believing a lie. They will believe in a lie. God wants us to have a discerning spirit. Which we talk, my husband talked on that Wednesday night. Discerning spirit so that we won't be taken in by anything or anybody at any time because he desires that we separate ourselves from false doctrine. In verse 16 of Jude, goes on to describe false teachers as grumblers, finding fault, falling after their own lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. They just want the advantage. That's all. People don't want to preach that because they're going to run, oh, we're going to run folks out to church and we start preaching against sin. Well, I want you to preach against sin. Because if you don't preach against sin, I'm going to hell. Yes. And hell is for eternity, baby. You're not coming up out of there. That is forever. I want you to preach the truth. Paul says we are to separate ourselves from them. 2 Corinthians 6 and 17. It says this be, and we, we often use this scripture right here to say, oh, well, you're not supposed to be married because you're not, uh, you unequally yoked. And that ain't what that scripture's talking about. Okay? This scripture's talking about being unequally yoked with unbelievers in the body of Christ, according to your faith. People coming in teaching false doctrines and you sitting up believing in it and being partakers, going into these different churches and going to these different places, believing what they're preaching. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about a marriage. 2 Corinthians 6 and 14 through 18. Be ye not unequally yoked, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Well, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Right. And what communion hath light with darkness? And what court, court hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? He's talking about what Jude was talking about. Right. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Who is the temple of the living God? 
We are. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, in order to be him, in order for him to be your God and for you to be him, you, you, you to be his people. Listen to what the word of God is saying. Wherefore, verse 17, come out from among them. Okay, now he just told you, he's going to be your God, you're going to be his people, he's going to walk in them, dwell in them. Now if he's going to dwell in you and he's going to walk in you, you have to do something. Amen. Yes. He said you got to what? Come out from among them and be ye separate, said yes. the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. He said he will do what? So he ain't receiving somebody. You think you being you think you being heard, but God ain't even receiving. Because you messing with some unclean stuff. You're not contending for the faith. God said, touch not anything that's unclean, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you. Right. And ye shall be my sons and daughters. Saith the Lord Almighty. Lord Almighty. He said that. He said if you're touching it. If you're not fighting for the good fight. If you're not contending for the faith. If you're messing around with things you should not be. And you're trying to receive me. I cannot receive you. I will not receive you. I will not. You have to contend, fight, struggle, baby. Do you think when Jesus went to the cross, that was easy peasy? He contended for the faith. We often feel as believers we need to be sweet to everybody. But I don't know a single verse in the Bible that instructs being sweet to those who sneak in with incorrect doctrine and a determination to divide the body of Christ. Sometimes we think that by being nice, mowing our neighbor's grass, baking cookies, smiling when they drive by, we'll convert people. Not true. How many of you believe that? Well, if I be nice to the people, they'll get you to come to church. I'm just showing them the way of the Lord. Now, that don't mean you're supposed to be ugly. Be a Christian like that. That don't mean that. But sometimes we think that being, being doing these things is going to cause them to be saved. There was no lovelier person than Jesus. Right. Yet his brothers did not believe on him until the cross and the resurrection. That is why it's imperative to preach Christ crucified. You can wave to your neighbor for 20 years and wave them right into hell. Or you can take the time to say, you know, Jesus died for you. He died that and bore your sins. That you can be reborn again. His desire is not for you to perish. But that you come to repentance. That you turn away from your old lifestyle and walk in newness of life. Paul makes no mention of indulging them or embracing their ideas. This doesn't mean we can just be harsh or ugly or uncut, but, but we do not have to tolerate false teaching. Some people out there that may be looking at this live on YouTube. You may be in a charismatic church, a ritualistic or a new age evangelistic church where the pastor doesn't believe the whole Bible. They don't teach the whole Bible. What you need to do is confront your leaders with the scripture. Right. Say, what does this say? Why are we not teaching this? When it's written right here in black and white, in red letter. <laughs> Why are we skipping over all these Bible verses and trying to weave and, and duck and dive and get things that just 
just appease the people instead of preaching the truth. Any individual who stands behind a pulpit is responsible to God to preach the truth and nothing but the truth. They are responsible to the families of the congregation because the truth of God's word is what protects you. Thank you, Jesus. Do you not know that if the truth is not being preached, you are unprotected? Right. You are not protected. You cannot afford to have your children learn a doctrine that will absolutely destroy their morality. I don't want my children destroyed. I said, God, I want my children saved. I don't want my children going to hell. I want them to live right. I want to be an example. I want to continue to show my children how to fight for the Lord. How to stand up and be right, walk right, talk right, act right. I don't want them doing the things that I did. I don't want to lead them in the wrong way. What kind of parent is that? I would be a fool to teach my children to destroy themselves. When you contend for the faith, you're saving your own household. My prayer has been, Lord, when he saved me, Lord, keep my children. Save my children. Show my children. God, that's the reason I'm living. That's the reason you said that my household has to be saved first. I want to be an example. Contend for the faith. Die for the faith. So that my children, let's say my, but my mom died for it, then I know I can stand and die for it. My God. Come on, believers. Come on, what are we doing? We're destroying ourselves because we got all this false ideology and false theology and false doctrine rolling around in our minds and we're believing it. And it's destroying our very fabric of our society and of the family. My God. If the leaders are not teaching truth, your mind and your children's mind are being corrupted. I'm going to say this in love. But it's going to have to be said. If you are somewhere and you're in a church that's not preaching truth, you need to get up and leave it immediately. And go where they're going to preach against sin. Go where they're going to tell you what's right. Go where they're going to tell you how to be saved. Go where they, they're not afraid to go against the status quo and only because they want to be popular before the people. A lot of people feel they can't leave a congregation because they grew up there their daddy and mama there sister and brother there but if they're not preaching truth baby you better run for your life I don't care who they are because mama can't save you daddy can't save you brother sister can't save you child can't save you God says save yourself from this untoward generation. You know who gonna have to save you, you. Yes. That's it. Yes. My mama couldn't save me. I had to save myself. I had to make a choice to live right. I had to make a choice to whether I was gonna contend for the faith. It is up to you. But what we feel we can't leave or that they might think, uh, uh, or you might think that your pastor won't mislead you all. Well, he's, he's so right, he's so holy. They won't mislead me. I tell people, I say, you know, don't, don't just listen to me, but go get your Bible and read it for yourself. Right. Yes, I ain't afraid to tell you go get the Bible and read it. Because I know you're going to find it in there. 
<laughs> See, when somebody is ready to tell you, go get the word and read it for yourself, they know you're not going to find what they're talking about in there. Right. So they ain't going to tell you that. I said, pick up your Bible, read it for yourself. I want you to read along with me. That's why it's good to have a Bible, so you can read it for yourself. So you can see it right in there, black bread and, and black and red letters. You know what Jesus said. You know what the apostle said. You know that it's in there. And you won't be, be misled. Sometimes we, we imagine they're strong. You imagine you're strong enough to withstand the effects of any inadvertent error. But let me tell you something. All it takes is a grain or two of untruth to corrupt a way of thinking. All it takes is one little seed planted in your way of thinking. One seed. There's a lot of false doctrine being taught. And if that is the situation that's going on in your life, whether you lead to people that are telling you, oh, that don't believe that, that's not true, you don't have to do it that way, go to the Word. Go to the Word of God. I was talking to somebody just the other day. I said, look, I said, it's not what, about what I say, but it's about what the Word of God say. I said, go get your Bible and read it. Especially if you are a parent. You can't afford to tolerate liberal, charismatic churches or schools that mixes in the truth just enough error to destroy your family. You can't tolerate it. When you know the truth and you hear someone preaching false doctrine, something inside of you is going to raise up immediately and you're going to perceive with some spiritual red flags in your spiritual senses that something's not right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm, something ain't right. That's right. Something's wrong here. Because I've had to do it. And I will go confront. And I will say, now, I want you to bring clarity to me in this scripture here. Because I, something was said, now, my spirit didn't agree with that. And, you know, I'm not trying to be confrontational, but if that's what it takes, but if we're not getting truth here, but I can't stay here. <laughs> you can't be afraid to do that. I remember I told my dad, my dad was going to church, I wasn't preaching truth. I said, Dad, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. Boy, me and my dad, we going at it. Like, you can't show me. I said, Dad, Jesus is God, manifested in the flesh. I said, it's right there in the word of God. It tells you it. I said, read it. I said, let's go to the first time I took it to the word. I said, Dad, I, I said, I want you to read this. So when he read the scripture, he was like, I said, who did it say was manifest in the flesh? God. <laughs> I said, now I know there's only one God, right? He's like, I said, now, so Dad, who, what God is it talking about right there? I want him to see it for himself. Right. And I said, now, what I want you to do, I want you to take that to your pastor. And I want you to ask your pastor to elaborate. Remember, we talked about that. To articulate to you what that means. I said, if your pastor cannot articulate that to you and break that scripture down to you and explain to you why he has not been preaching the truth to you and explain what that scripture is talking about, then you need to leave there. My dad said, I sure am. Lord, my dad did. He went to his pastor. He asked his pastor, can you explain to me what the scripture means right here? And he couldn't do it. He said, well, why haven't you been teaching us about this? He couldn't explain it. Needless to say, my dad left the church. But see, you have to contend for the faith. There's something wrong. What are you deserting? Is, what you are deserting is the true Holy Ghost sounding an alarm in your spirit. But to have an effective filter, you must commit God's truth, which is the Bible, Bible verses, biblical principles to your mind. John 14 and 26 says, But the confidence, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your what? Understand. Remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. 
Now, how are you going to know what God said to you? How are you going to know? Through the word of God. So then he will be able to bring a scripture. Well, I remember. And then the Lord will bring a scripture back to you. He said this. Let me, let me turn here real quick. Right. And then they say this. Some ain't lining up. Then the true Holy Ghost has material to use as he teaches guys and brings things to your remembrance. Do you know the basics of your faith? If your Bible were destroyed, would you be able to explain what you believe and why? Wow. Come on now. If the Bible were destroyed, you didn't have no Bible. Nobody said, you better not pick a Bible up. They'll burn the Bible. They'll have took the Bible away. Are you going to be able to still believe what you believe? And be able to explain what you believe without a Bible? Are you willing to contend for your faith? A lot of people don't want any conflict. They don't want confrontation in their life. And yet the biblical admonition to contend carries with it a sense of wrestling, tension, and struggle. When it comes to false teachers who do not believe the entire Bible is the inspired, infallible word of the living God, Jude tells us that a battle is necessary. You're going to have to confront. Be encouraged. Think of how scripture has survived through all the ages. Right. Do you not realize that the word of God, when they tried to burn it, when they tried to take it out of schools, when they tried to beat folk, when they kill folk, when they put folk in prison, they tried everything to wipe God out. Taking the Ten Commandments out, can't pray in Jesus' name. They trying to do everything in this world to take Jesus out. But do you know that it has survived and it's going to continue to thrive and survive until the coming of the Lord? No matter what they do, they can never erase God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. They can never erase the Bible. They can burn it, but when it's in your heart, he said, hide the word of God in your heart that I might not sin against thee. When you sin against God, it's because God's word has not been hid in your heart. You are not contending for the faith. You are just going haphazardly by. Thinking God is a little trophy. Thinking God is your sugar daddy. Thinking God is your sugar mama. God ain't your sugar daddy. Whenever you need something, you run to him. But whenever you don't, you're doing what you want to do. Come on. He ain't no toy. He ain't no plaything. That ain't how God work. The only time you pray is when you got a need. But you don't hit your knees no other time. But you're doing everything else under the God's blue sun. That ain't how God works. That's not a blessed life. That's a cursed life. That is a cursed life. My God. The only reason we have the Bible and institution that preach the truth is that some faithful believer, a soldier, set themselves apart to defend the faith, to fight for it, and to multiply it by getting the word to others. Some faithful believers said, I'm going to stand. No matter what comes against me. And I'm going to get the word of God into as many people's lives and minds as God would allow me. I'm going to contend for the faith. I don't care if they talk about me. They run me in the ground. They beat me. They slap me. They spit on me. Whatever they do. But I know my Redeemer lives. And he lives inside. And let me tell you something, I remember when we were, and I'm getting ready to close, because it's getting late, but, and I'm not finished, but I remember when they were getting ready to pass, the, they were passing these homosexual books in the library. And, and, and I remember we were living in North Carolina at the time, and they said we want a couple people from the church to go down and, and stand, you know, and speak a word, you know, and say, you know, why this should not happen. And I remember we got down there, and you know, God knows what's in every person. You know, we, we can dress nice, look nice, and all that, but God knows what's deep down in. All right, now. 
God, no, I'm, I'm a fighter. And so we went down there, and all the people outside, and I mean, look, we're inside the library, and they were having this open forum, and people standing up talking why they shouldn't do it, and why they should, and da da da. And this preacher got up, and he, God allowed him to be the last one to stand up and speak, and I mean, he, he, he brought the house down. The Holy Ghost, you can just feel the presence of God in that place. And I remember when after that was over, we went outside and they had people was up and standing at the top of the street of library. And I remember I was standing there and, and these people were talking. They were like, well, just because it, it's their right da, 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 to do what they want to do and who are y'all to try to tell us? And I remember I was sitting there, some rose up in there. And I said, well, you know, I was really nice and sweet. And I said, well, you know, God loves you, but he don't love the city. I said, God destroys cities. He destroyed nations. He destroyed people. That's right. Generation. Mm -hmm. And boy, that conversation, he got heated. And I remember he got up in my face like this. And he said, I don't care what you say. <laughs> and boy, some rose up in me. And I said, I don't care what you say. Because for God I live. And for God I'm going to die. And baby, if you don't turn from your sin, you're going to burn in hell. Uh, oops. And I mean, I stood my ground. And I mean, my brother came. He said, come on, sister, sister come on. And I said, for God I will live. And for God I'll die. We have to contend for the faith. Amen. We have to contend. We cannot be afraid of confrontation. We cannot be afraid of they, the, the, the apostles died. They gave their life. They were beaten. They were whipped. And they left out of the city rejoicing because there was beat for the name of Jesus. Amen. Now had he punched me, had he spit on me, I would have looked him in his face and said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. We cannot be afraid. We have to stand and fight for the faith, people of God. Because it's coming a time where we're going to be in that place. And you're going to have to stand and fight. Or you're going to have to give your life. And when that time comes, what are you going to do? Are you going to buckle in and say, I'm going to take the mark? Or are you going to stand? I'll take it. And be doomed to an eternity in hell. Are you going to stand? And so I'm going to be like you said, I'm going to continue. And I'm going to be like Timothy because Timothy was a timid man. But after Paul wrote and encouraged him, Timothy got boldness. And Timothy became the bishop in the book of Revelations in the church. Of the churches of Revelation, he preached and he taught to them. And he contended for the faith. John the Revelator was born in oil, but they couldn't kill him because God wouldn't let him die. But they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos, and that's how you got the book of Revelations written. Because he contended for the faith. People of God, believers, we will have to contend. We cannot let allow people to stand and preach apostasies and false doctrines in the house of God. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they name is. I don't care what they look like. I don't care if they're your ace coon booty. God said, don't partake in it. But correct them in love so that they will live and not die. I would rather for you to live and tell you the truth. Then tell you a lie. You die and go to hell. I would rather you take the infliction than take the deceitful kisses of the enemy. I would rather inflict the wound and you be healed than take the deceitful kisses of the enemy. We got to be the spirit is saying, contend. We're going to have to fight for the faith as we're standing. We're 
you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight to be saved. You're going to have to fight for your children. You're going to have to fight for your family. You're going to have to fight for your dad and your mom and your sisters. You're going to have to fight. Come on. The Spirit is beckoning the church. We got to stand. We got to fight the good fight of faith. Father, we thank you. Father, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would have your way tonight, Father. You know, Lord God, the word has been for us. Father, we ask right now that you would do a work in the lives of your people, those that are seeking you, God. Those that have a need of you, Lord. Father, we ask right now that you would just move upon their hearts, God. That you would move in their lives, Father, to help them to receive the truth of your word. God, help them to turn away. Help them to contend to stay in the fight. For God, you created them. You brought them this far, God, not to leave and forsake them. Or not for them to turn back. But for God, for them to go forward. And have newness of life to experience the joy and the peace. Some of you in here need peace tonight. Some of you need rest. Some of you ain't even sleeping. Your mind just bogged down with all kind of problems and troubles, worries and fears. The Bible says men's heart gonna be failing. That's why people are dying of heart attacks and strokes and high blood pressure because they're so worried about things yes. they can't fix. Yes. Things they can't control. Because the lives that they're living. Okay. Some of you are sick and body. Can you hear it? He said, Beloved above all things, I wish that I would prosper yes. and be in good health. You know why you're not in good health? Because your soul is not prosperous. He said, and prosper, even as your soul prospers. You want good health? Your soul has to prosper. Some of you need a touch from God. And if you're saying, God, that's me tonight, I need a 